Yes, thank you very much, um, Dr. Longsworth, and uh, thank you for the moderation so far. I believe we've been uh, touring the Caribbean with a, a transatlantic journey to Tanzania, and we now fly back to Caribbean, where we are actually supposed to be. Uh, but uh, I think it was worthwhile traveling transatlantic to the Tanzania uh, case because obviously for Tanzania, the efforts of Dr. Ramaya and the Ministry of Health and many, many other stakeholders have meant a lot to the NCD and diabetes response of the United Republic of Tanzania. And this is not just something that I say or Dr. Ramaya would say, this has been recognized uh, within Tanzania and also international level at various occasions. Uh, there is a report coming out soon uh, by an expert group in the WHO in Geneva looking at integrating NCDs into other health program areas and one of the two of the seven cases uh, from country level cases will be based on the experience from from Tanzania. And I could also add a little bit on the investment and the support from our side to the Tanzania story. Uh, over the years we have provided grants of approximately aggregated value of $3.5 million over the past decade. Whether that's a lot or not, I'm not the one to judge, but I think the results are, are noteworthy. You know, obviously there's a huge of other uh, support in kind and other contributions, but from our perspective, that has been our donation. We were uh, before, Dr. Amaya, uh, we were in Barbados, we were in Jamaica, we were in Trinidad and Tobago, and we were in Bahamas. And then I was uh, requested by Trevor and Maisha to look at some of the programs we have supported here in the Caribbean and see whether we could convince some of the responsibles to come and speak about that. Because I think the title of this panel is Spotlight on, on the World Diabetes Foundation. Actually, I would probably, if I had had time, I would have reviewed it because it's Spotlight. It's the spotlight on, on what is being done in the countries by the stakeholders and then with our support. We prefer in the WDF to, you know, we, we have the, our goal is to support countries and stakeholders implementing meaningful programs to uh, prevent and control diabetes and other NCDs. So we always wish to give the word and the stage to those we support. And that will happen now and we are going to um, go to six, uh, we're going to have six different speakers. Uh, we will go to the Francophone Caribbean, we will go to the Anglo Anglophone and also to the Hispano, uh, Hispanophone uh, Caribbean. And we will start, I think you say the Hispanophone or the Spanish speeding, <laughs> Spanish, Spanish speeding. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Iberophone, I believe you say. Yeah, sorry. But, um, uh, let's not go into that, but we'll actually start in the francophone because we will ask Dr. Nancy Larco, who is here, from the Haitian um, Foundation uh, for or against the, for diabetes and, and cardiovascular uh, um, care um, to take the stage and tell us about the experience of if uh, Hadimak in in Haiti, so I believe that the slides will will be they're already there. You didn't send me this one. Yes. Okay. Well, and then please let's give an applause to. Has been said my my first language is French, so I apologize in advance for my pronunciation and some words that would be in French and pronounced in English. So. Um, I am the executive director of uh, FADIMAC. Um, can you help me with that? I go forward or forward is, oh, I was looking at the button and the bottom, okay. Point it to, okay. So uh, what we are, FADIMAC is for Fondation Haitienne de Diabète et de Maladie Cardiovasculaire. And FADIMAC is a civil society 
for nonprofit. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization gathering members of all level of Asian population and um, from patients to medical uh, personnel. So we're a big group and uh, we have started with the help of Lions Club uh, 31 years ago. And it was started with my dad and I continue with the movement. So um, uh, some members of FADIMAC, we have about 10,000 uh, registered members, 30,000 active members right now. And we mostly help needy patients for them to receive care on a regular basis at our facility. And it's about 1,500 people. So we do also help children. And up to now we have about um, three, uh, let's say at, in 2010, we only had 20 children registered as type one. And now they are about 350. Okay, so, so um, I have heard um, reading the books which are on your table, I didn't find any numbers for AT and I was a little sad about it. So um, I do have numbers like our population is about 1 million um, people and uh, the age distribution, excuse me? 11 million, what did I say? Oh, no, that far from that. And uh, unfortunately, our national budget doesn't put a lot of money in the health sector. And that's why I always say that we are not really advanced. And for, and some numbers for the prevalence, uh, that's a study that we have done uh, uh, many years ago, FADIMAC we organized and up to many, uh, some years, uh, the Minister of Health wa wa was calling us for the numbers. And I say, now we have to make a bigger study. So uh, based on those, that study called PREDIAD, which was published in the Diabetes and uh, Metabolism Journal in 2004, uh, we have about 40% of the population older than 20 years old with hypertension, which is about 2 million. That is catastrophic. And um, for diabetes, it's 7%. So about 370,000 people with diabetes. And what happened with um, the, at the time of the earthquake, when we, um, in 2010, on January 2010, uh, many changes happened to Haiti. We received a lot of donation, but the non-communicable disease were really treated as a poor um, person because a trauma was the first, um, uh, reason for to give care. So we were, um, the Minister of Health called Fadima and asked us to organize uh, clinics for people with um, um, chronic disease, mostly diabetes and hypertension. And that's where the World Diabetes Foundation uh, came, is coming because they helped us uh, straighten our activities. And uh, so we were able to give more care to uh, many people. So kind of activities that we had before, but that was strengthened by the help of the World Diabetes Foundation. So we worked a lot in awareness, um, screening, education for patients. And in fact, we have a program on five days where the patient can come with their family and receive um, education. And um, so we also had fairs, so every year with the World Diabetes Foundation, and we we'll use a lot of our young leaders to help us. So they go to the community, talk in clinics, but also they help us in the fair. And usually it's faster with them when they make the blood glucose test instead of physicians or nursing who are taking their time. So that's really interesting to use them help, their help in those activities. So as you can see in the photo on the down right, uh, Fadimak was uh, at the high level on, in 2011 at, uh, in New York at the uh, National Nations Unis, so United Nations. And um, at, from that time, we have been putting the pressure to um, uh, ask the Minister of Health to really put NCDs in their program and um, doing a lot of advocacy, but it took us time to get there. 
So in 2010, uh, after the earthquake, um, the Minister of Health, um, we, um, the Minister of Health, um, we signed an MOU with them and uh, in which they recognized FADIMAC as the reference institution in the management of diabetes and cardiovascular disease in Haiti. And since then, we have been advocating to move um, forward the cause of NCDs and put the pressure on the Ministry of Health that in French is called MSPP, so for Ministère de la Santé Publique et de la Population. And uh, so we create a task force last January and, uh, and ask them uh, that task force is to work with them and see how they can put um, the NCGs in their agenda. Okay, so other things that we have do we are doing on a regular basis, that training for uh, we educate patients, but you have to train also the medical personnel and put them on the same level, a standardized um, um, training so they can give the same speech to the patients. So we use a lot of, of um, um, uh, posters and with um, pictures that the patient can recognize themselves in. And uh, further down, that's a, a training that we're doing every year. And in fact, last year, we received 300 um, physicians, mostly students in their last year of medical school, but also uh, resident uh, fellows and uh, physicians for the um, 30 hours in our curriculum for the diabetology. Of four hours in emergency on endocrinology and eight hours in um, endocrinology, pediatric endocrinology, which classes, I mean, trainings which are not given at their universities. Why should I press? Okay, we also have program for children. That's the uh, not known groups because um, in 2000, we started that program in um, June 2010. And there from, uh, we saw that at that time, people didn't believe that children could have diabetes. So a lot of them were dying. And that's the number which is written on that poster that we published um, 52 children percent of children arriving in GKA at the state university like six years ago they were um, um, they died because of coming too late or the, the treatment was not appropriate so um, we developed many camps for the children and those camp uh, we can have them uh, with the um, help of some international like and also national uh, groups so we do also have clinics and we work a lot in prevention because the population can't pay treatment. So it's better to prevent and we give with the education and some screening um, for the eye, for the kidney and for the feet. And um, that's pictures on the front of our organization. Sometimes we can't even, we have to stop receiving patients because we don't have enough space. Uh, and uh, also, we, thanks to Americas, three years ago, we were able to have a, a food clinic with uh, very well equipped. And there we are doing the screening and we go out and, and we give training also, thanks to the Jamaican Diabetes Association who came to train our staff. And the picture and, uh, and uh, it's our dr uh, next project and our dream, but it started because we already have the land to have a bigger center so where we can give more appropriate services. So the mobile clinic that um, the bus that you see here was provided by the World Diabetes Foundation as we couldn't continue to have free clinics after the earthquake because we needed to rebuild our financial um, aspects uh, of, I mean, financial capacity. So um, we were able to have that bus and we had um, different clinics, public clinics, where we could do and continue the services that we have started just after the earthquake. And uh, those are in different places in Haiti. And as you see, our young leaders, they are part of our team and doing screening and also uh, screening, blood glucose screening and also um, eye screening. So some results from that um, uh, 
uh, uh, that from that project. So the, as you can see, awareness we could we were able to touch a lot of people. The implementation of twelve diabetic clinic. Many people were screened for eye, for diabetes, for food complication, and also a lot of patients were diagnosed and taken care of. We were able also to train um, many uh, medical personnel. So that just uh, 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 as we were talking about the, the the earthquake, and there is a new um, um, setting, a new IDF initiative recently launched, launch, uh, where uh, uh, about diabetes in humanitarian setting, and some of our groups, FADIMAC, World Diabetes Foundation, the WHO, are part of our uh, meeting today. So, in conclusion. Um, I would like to congratulate uh, the H. Um, that's my speech. Uh, it has to be written because I was telling you my English is not very good. But anyway, um, I would like to congratulate uh, HCC for the tremendous work they have done in promoting the civil society action in the Caribbean where most governments lack funds. As a civil society, we have the same responsibility as our government, which is to make things move forward in our field of expertise. Even though we don't have the financial capital, we would never get discouraged when it comes to human lives. And as it's always repeated in our NCGs um, meetings, after all, it's everyone's business, the NCGs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nancy. I think we will proceed gradually, but if there are any questions as we move along, uh, please raise your hand and we will take it. Uh, otherwise, keep it for the, for the final session. This was uh, the presentation from Haiti uh, by Nancy, and I think Haiti is one of the countries in the Caribbean where we have had a, a partnership for the longest period of time. We actually have two projects. This was the first one. There's another ongoing one, and I think I'll Yes, that's okay. That's okay. I'll I'll mention it. And we also work with other two other agencies in Haiti. But for for the FADIMAC, I believe our total contribution has been around five hundred thousand dollars over the past decade. I should also have said in the beginning that that the Healthy Caribbean Coalition and its focus on civil society is obviously very appealing and very relevant for 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 the WDF. I, we didn't do the, a recent calculation, but I think we did it last year, and m almost 60% of our funding uh, support is, uh, is given to civil society, broadly speaking. So this is, of course, uh, also a sign of the fact that we believe that any, there is no meaningful NCD response anywhere without civil society. And we have had countries with, uh, in the Caribbean with uh, collaboration over a decade, but we also have countries where we only very recently started to have a partnership. And it's actually not even really started yet, but Mr. Castillo from Belize will give us the details. So please welcome the next speaker. It's uh, Mr. Castillo from the Belize Diabetes Association. We need the Belize presentation. <clears throat> and of course, I can say while we get the slide for Belize that any detail anybody here wishes to know about the modality of funding, which, which areas of interventions that the WDF can support. Uh, we are here, my colleague Mr. Madsen is here. And I think from the presentation by Mr. Dr. Ramaya, you were able to see what, what areas we fund. There are also things we do not fund, of course. There we are. Over to you, uh, Anthony. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. All right. Good afternoon. Okay. All right. The Belize Diabetes Association is a support group for persons living with diabetes. We are an NGO. Our motto is Healthy Choices for Healthy Living. For us at the association level, we are challenged with many things. We look at food, medication, and exercise for persons living with diabetes. 
one of the challenge, one of the questions frequently asked, now that I've developed diabetes, now that I've catch diabetes, what can I eat? Right? What can I eat? Food. We look at food. One of the issues we have for our people in Belize is eating a lot, eating plenty. We have that in the Caribbean. Is it a Belize thing or just in the Caribbean? <laughs> right? Plenty. We always say to our people, it's not what you eat, but it's how much. We don't say there are any bad foods. It's portion size. So we ask our folks to be close to your nutritionist, your dietitian, to assist you in determining how much and what is the quantity to eat, to consume. Then we look at medication. Usually what would happen, a person goes to the physician, go to the doctor, they're diagnosed with diabetes. Um, for most persons, they're diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. They usually place on some oral medication in most cases. But because of where we live, we are located, again, Belize in the tropics, in the middle of Central America, we also have quite a bit of herbs and barks and other medication that can be used. And if you speak with 10 persons, they'll give you 10 possible cure for diabetes, All right? So we also have this challenge where you go to your doctor, you go to your physician, and you um, prescribe medication, some oral medication, but then when you go home, your neighbor, your friend, your relative will then prescribe something else to you. All right? Sadly, the time they'll say, you can put away with your oral medication and take this herb. That is usually a challenge. We at the association, what we say to our members is if you will try, or if you'll use something else, I don't know what is prescribed to you by a doctor, please communicate with your physician, your doctor, tell them exactly what else you want to try along with. I'm certain that there may be herbs and barks and other local remedy that you can use, which may lower your sugar level, but that could also put you into crisis. So that again is a challenge. Exercise. We encourage our folks to exercise as well, but exercise is like going to church. You could find so much reason not to go, <laughs> not, to not to exercise. I'm tired. I don't have proper footwear, right? I need company, right? So these are our three focus, food, medication, and exercise, right? And we are quite challenged with imparting these information to our membership. Diabetes prevalence. The International Diabetes Federation 8th edition, ATRAS released in December, state that 14.2% of Belize adult population is living with diabetes. I think uh, Dr. Morrison said something to this range this morning. This is an equivalent of approximately 50,000 people um, living with a condition in Belize, and this is the age group 20 to 79. Belize is, uh, I think, twice the size of Jamaica, but a very small population, right? We have some like 350,000 people living in Belize, right? But 14.2% is quite a number of persons to be living with this condition, diabetes, right? So uh, we also struggle like many of the other Caribbeans, to try to control this condition. The Diabetes Association uh, was started back in 1991 by a group of uh, professionals, doctors. Um, it has grown. It is now managed mainly by uh, laypersons. Uh, we do have uh, physicians and other professionals who work along with us. Uh, they have meeting, we have meeting every third Saturday of the month. Initially, it was only in Belize City, but now we have formed branches in two of our southernmost districts, which is Punta Gorda and Dangriga. We also form a branch in the capital, nation capital, Belmapan, and we also have another branch recently formed in Corozal. Corozal was a challenge because it is right next to our Mexican border. Uh, what most persons would do from Corozal, from the northernmost border, is to just go over the border and seek attention. And they don't see the need to form a group for themselves. But fortunately, um, two months or so ago, we formed the branch in Corozal, right next to the, uh, to the Mexican border. And that, that's a growth and development for the association.
Okay. Thanks to the World Diabetes Foundation, we, like some of the other Caribbean territories, uh, have been given a grant um, for a program. And this, the money has come from World Diabetes Foundation. It is managed by the Belize Diabetes Association along with the Ministry of Health. We will be training health educators, community health workers, and rural health workers uh, from this grant. And I'll explain as I go along what we'll be doing under this program. And I'm proud to say that we do have a good relationship with our Ministry of Health in Belize City, um, fortunately, and also with PAHO. Those are some of our stronger partners who assist us in this fight uh, against diabetes. The objective uh, of this program is to train and educate health educators, community health workers, rural health nurses. These people will be trained under this project to carry out community-based diabetes lay education across the six districts of Belize. As I said, Belize is very vast um, from north to south, and we do have uh, uh, health, it, community health workers in every district. And these are the people who eventually will be trained and the information will be passed on to the patient who visit the clinics and the health centers. Our objective, develop cultural appropriate diabetes self-management training in coordination with the diabetes experts within Belize. Belize is multicultural and multi-ethnic. While English is the official language, depending on which part of the country you are, there will be another tongue, another language which will be spoken. Um, at, uh, survey done, I think by Camde uh, from Central America, it is stated that the persons in Belize who show high incidence of diabetes are people of color, black people, and also Hispanic. That is like the entire country of Belize. So, <laughs> right? And for, and for most Belizeans, most Belizeans will speak two languages. We have so many different languages in Belize. So the persons who will be trained, they will be trained in English but whenever they go into their community, they may need to change their tongue, right? That they could reach to the persons um, that they'll be training. This training will be based off the curriculum developed by the Pan-American Health Organization. PAHO recently developed a curriculum that we'll be using. So we won't reinvent the wheel. We'll just use this curriculum to impart the, the skills and, and knowledge to our folks. By the way, Belize is the only English-speaking country in Central America, and we enjoy both being a part of the Caribbean and also in Central America. But I feel much at home when I come into the Caribbean because I see people who look like me. <laughs> Unlike when I go into Central America, then I have to change my tongue. For us, whenever we go over the border, either you go to the western or southern border or the northern border, you have to, you'll change your tongue. You, you need to speak Spanish. <laughs> yeah. And my last name as well, Castillo, is also a Spanish last name. <laughs> Within two weeks following recruitment, diabetes self-management education will begin. I was hoping that by the time this um, program here, this ECC program begin, I would have said what we are doing. But instead, I speak on what we will be doing. Uh, when this grant was offered to us, I'm not sure, I almost think, most of the Caribbean also have the same issue that we have. Uh, we received a grant in US dollars. To open a US account is a challenge for us in Belize. I'm not sure how much of the Caribbean has that because of the money laundering. Um, it's been about almost two months before we could open. Just last week, Friday, we finally got the okay to open an account to accept the grant, right? We need to convince him that this is clean money. This is good money we're getting. <laughs> <laughs> so finally, the, the central bank and banks in Belize okayed, and now the funds are in our account, and as soon as we go back, we will begin um, the program. Right. The community health workers, along with the rural health nurses, will meet with groups of six or seven participant patients for a maximum of two hours. The team will aim to give two training sessions per month for a total of six to eight sessions. So as I said, the community health workers will get the information and they'll pass it on to the patient. Again, from my observation at the association level, the two challenges we also have is 
at times the lack of education. We need to educate our people on, on diabetes. There are so many complications where diabetes is concerned. There are some folks who just don't have the education, so they don't know what to eat. They don't know um, about proper footwear, uh, the frequency of getting a self check, etc. So the lack of education is one issue. Then again, we also have compliance. They always say for persons living with diabetes as one of the most uncompliant person you can find. You will hear them say things like, give it to me, let me eat or drink it, something have to kill me. <laughs> Just give it, right? So we are not always compliant. So even when the information is shared and they have the education, then compliance again is another issue. So under this program, we will try to encourage our persons to do the right thing. Uh, you get the education, then be compliant. In collaboration with the Epidemiological Unit of the Ministry of Health, an appropriate data collection, storage analysis, and sharing mechanism will be established. Again, with the Ministry of Health assistance, we will establish this, and we'll have all our data in place. Uh, outcome, improve and increase level of knowledge and awareness of diabetes and self-management at the community level, including process of referral to additional primary care service for diabetes patients. We also work with others like uh, Belize comes with the visually impaired. If there are persons who may, at this time, BCVI also have a program for diabetes retinopathy. So we encourage our folks to go get their eyes checked. Um, if you may need laser or whatever treatment, then BCVI will take care of that for you. Um, if there are persons who may be showing signs of kidney disease, we also work closely with the Kidney Association of Belize. So it will be a con combined effort. At the end of the day, it should be a, a better society for us. We'll have trained uh, health workers. This information will be passed on to the patient right, who will be in a better position to take care of themselves. We always say that you go to the doctor, you spend 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour perhaps, right? Uh, the other remainder of time, you're on your own, right? You need to know to take care of yourself, right? So it's important for you to get the education, for us to get the education to the patient who in turn will be able to take care of themselves, right? And uh, have a better society. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anthony. I think that was a brilliant presentation and you didn't mention it, but as I'm reading my notes, we're looking at around 40 primary health care services centers, right? Yeah. I don't know whether Dr. Castaneda from the ministry would like to comment quickly or you, or we can wait. I don't know whether it's okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, well, very encouraging presentation from uh, Dr. Castillo. We will move quickly on. Uh, as Dr. Ramaya said in his overall presentation about the work of the World Diabetes Foundation, we always hope that or seek to uh, support interventions that are part of the national NCD response, uh, national diabetes and NCD response of any country. That sometimes takes years. Other times we start with a proposal coming into our inbox from uh, a Ministry of Health or an NCD uh, non chronic disease unit and most of the times together with other agencies as we just saw in Belize, but also as we saw in Guyana some years ago, because we received a proposal from, well, a combined proposal developed by the Ministry of Health, the Chronic Disease Units, and the University of Toronto, which is also represented here by Dr. Ostro, who is sitting in the audience. And that has been going on for some time. And uh, I would like to invite Dr. Kavita Singh who is the chronic disease coordinator at the Ministry of Public Health in Guyana. Over to you, Kavitsa. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. Um, good morning, everyone. So I was sitting down on the panel there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It's afternoon. Right. So I was feeling very happy because um, the two presenters before me seem to have been going at a very good pace. And then I'm like, okay, so there will be no rush. And then lo and behold, uh, Professor Hassel came and started showing his sign. So um, I'm gonna make this very quickly. To begin with, my pre um, this presentation doesn't, it's gonna be very short, but it by no means 
the only thing that Guyana is doing as it relates to diabetes and NCDs. However, um, as the spotlight was on the or is on WDF, I've chosen to actually speak about the Diabetes Care Project, which um, is funded um, primarily by the World Diabetes Foundation. So you might be looking at my very colorful first page and um, you might be saying, oh, it's kind of, you know, like just bumping at you. But what I wanted to do is just reiterate that it was not just the MOPH Guyana project along with WDF or U of T, but we would have had as many international collaboration and national collaboration as you could have um, possibly imagined. So we had um, Ministry of Public Health Guyana, the World Diabetes uh, Foundation, Orbis, IPOX, Wondor, and the University of Toronto partnering on this particular project. So what really is the Guyana Diabetes Care Project? So this project is basically a flow on from a previous or two previous projects that would have been um, completed in Guyana with um, funding from Canada, the Diabetes um, Foot Care Project. So this was just a follow on. Um, so the project started in 2016 and hopefully we'll get some good word which will tell us that it will go on till August 2019. Um, as you can see, it had a total of 453,000 US dollars total. Most of that, of course, coming from the World Diabetes Foundation. Um, it, it, the proposal was, of course, um, developed in collaboration with the Pan American Health Organization office in Guyana, who provided all the technical support on the development of this, um, of this proposal. And basically, it dealt with um, adapting three um, level two diabetes intervention, which comes off of the um, disease control priorities. So those, um, adapt um, those three areas were eye care, antenatal care, and health promotion. Of course, um, the eye and antenatal care were very new projects or, or new services that were implemented in the country. And the uh, project has, um, it's very multi-component, as you can see, there are five components. The first one, which deals with screening and treatment for patients with diabetic retinopathy. The second component, also screening and treatment for patients with diabetes and pregnancy. The third one, health promotion and education. And in that um, particular component, we would have um, sought to develop and validate a tool for screening persons for, um, who are at risk for diabetes. The fourth component dealt with support for the redevelopment of the global health information system, which is basically an electronic medical record system at the Ministry of Public Health. And of course, a fifth component, which had to do with the overall administration of this project. So, oh, There you go. So component one, like I said, components one and two were very much new to Guyana. So that sought to actually um, implement screening and treatment for patients with diabetic retinopathy. Um, of course, this particular component would have received additional support from Orbis and IPAX. We saw equipment being bought, two retinal ca um, cameras, a la and laser and other associated equipment. And we found in this um, component, we would have established a center primarily um, aimed at screening and treating patients for diabetic retinopathy. Of course, the training was intense and, and very widespread. We had trained or we have trained three full-time optometrists, two um, ophthalmology nurses, we would have developed and implemented an in-house training module as it relates to screening and treatment for um, diabetic retinopathy. There are additionally seven, uh, 17 ophthalmologists and 29 nurses who were screened in diagnosis and management. And then we actually moved into other areas to screen more um, medical doctors and nurses in the primary healthcare um, facilities to be able to actually uh, refer patients to be screened. Each component would have had um, 
a public awareness component. So we would have developed um, these flyers and subsequently we printed them. So when we went to outreaches, when you spoke to a patient, you just gave them that flyer, which was actually um, had information as it relates to diabetic retinopathy and how and where to get screened and treated. Um, of course, the component is also very much widespread whereby we target um, the public at national events such as World Diabetes Day, World um, Sight Day. And there is the mon monitoring and evaluation component. And soon enough, we're going to begin a client satisfaction survey. So component 200, once again, um, a new service. We know there is diabetes and pregnancy, but there were no established protocol at our only national referring hospital. So with help from Wound Doors and the IDF Wings um, protocol, we were able to develop and establish a protocol to screen and treat patients at the Georgetown Hospital OBGYN clinic for um, diabetes and pregnancy. Mind you, Georgetown Public Hospital is our only national referring institution and their clinic basically caters for patients with um, high risk conditions in obstetrics and gynecology. So um, once again, human capacity was built, public awareness components rolled out whereby once a patient has been detected with uh, diabetes and pregnancy, there were reminders, encouragement by way of text messages, which were sent to those patients' phones. We would have also printed um, a booklet for them to take home, which outlined, you know, what foods you should eat, how you should exercise, how often you should test, how you should take your meds. Um, and of course, they're always actively involved in all of our um, national events and health day celebration. So as it relates to the monitor and evaluation um, segment for this component, we have now established the module for diabetes and pregnancy on the GHIS. And so far, 33 patients have been entered into this database. And we, we're, we, the entering of the data is currently ongoing. And to date, we have screened 1,090 women at this clinic for gestational diabetes and diabetes and pregnancy. And we've had a total of 276 patients with gestational diabetes who were diagnosed. So that gives us a prevalence of 26% um, they are about, which is very high. Um, component 300, that comes directly under the Ministry of Public Health. Um, so, what we did was to integrate diabetes education or more diabetes education and awareness into this component, but it, all, it, it, it wasn't by itself. It was very much paired up with all of our other promotional um, activities, our awareness, our sensitization campaigns. However, point to note here is that we would have started the development and we're currently in the process of validating the Guyana Diabetes um, Risk Score. What really is the risk score is just eight simple questions that's administered to the patient or the participant, I should say, and um, then their, their, a blood sample is taken off for HbA1c and then you correlate it to see if it actually will um, has any correlation towards that patient developing type 2 diabetes. However, in November last year, we would have used the data that we were currently collecting at that point in time. And we did a multivariate regression analysis, which actually gave us an accrued ratio of 0.829, which is almost close to one. So it's telling us we're kind of right on target. And the fourth component, which is the um, global health information system, which basically Guyana would have developed an electronic medical record um, a couple of years ago when I just became a doctor in 2009, but it, it lacked work and there was no funding, there was no infrastructure to continue it. So this um, project actually provided the funding, providing the resources, the human resource in order to um, make this GHIS a reality and currently we're piloting it in one health center, but I see the potential outcome of this module is actually that we're going to have an electronic um, NCDs registry. And of course, 
that the fifth and final component, which has to do with the administration, and I'm not going to bore you with that. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Kavita. <clears throat> to us in the World Diabetes Foundation, this is an example of quite a complex uh, approach with four different components under a national NCD response governed by the NCD unit of the Ministry of Health, but with involvement of a variety of stakeholders. So, so I believe this is multi-stakeholder approach or multi-sectoralism, and, and there are many components, of course, that Kavita couldn't include in, in the short time she had. We will move on. Uh, I think we keep questions to when we are at the end. But the next presenter is uh, Dr. James Ospedales from CARFA. And we're gonna move the, a little bit the, the focus because the first three presenters have looked very much at um, control programs, awareness programs, uh, risk factor awareness programs. But the, this fourth uh, case, country case that we have included in this panel uh, looks at a school based intervention and a, a childhood uh, obesity prevention program in two of the smaller island states of the Caribbean uh, in St. Lucia and Grenada, but uh, implemented through uh, the CARFA. And uh, I guess I don't need to say uh, more because James will tell us the details. Over to you, James. Thank you very much. Good, uh, good uh, is it afternoon, yeah? Good afternoon. I'll try and be quick. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present. We were very happy when uh, this project was accepted for funding um, and uh, beginning to go upstream to try to prevent uh, childhood obesity. Uh, the agency CARFA uh, incorporates some of the functions of the former Caribbean Food and Nutrition Institute and works on surveillance on policy guidelines, uh, research where uh, food and nutrition are concerned. Um, and this project is going to aim to identify factors in those two countries that uh, uh, play with the, the consumption of healthy food and physical activity in Grenada and St. Lucia to document them and uh, really think through what are the barriers to this and what kind of interventions are feasible in, in those settings in those countries. Identify the main physical, economic, sociocultural and political factors that impact eating and healthy eating and physical activity, rank them, uh, determine which can be influenced in the two-year intervention period and whether any difference has been made. The project is $225,000. Here are the phases, uh, baseline, intervention, and evaluation. And the intervention including students, teachers, and families, uh, including CAP studies, anthropometry, and uh, fitness measurements, uh, focus groups, training, and so on. Um, the roles and responsibilities, who carries it out, uh, and the sort of functions of different actors is shown here. And the other critical stakeholders, there's a country coordinator, there's a country team, the school team, the school, and, and the food service personnel in the school, including in the community and parents and families. The intended issues around sustainability, uh, which is one of the full, Foci is, is by having local capacity built with ongoing regional support, we're able to have long-term sustainability. And some of Alafia's research yesterday showed that, especially for the smaller countries, regional support uh, is pretty important. So the training capacity building, the incorporation into annual in-service training, and this is going to link quite strongly to the six-point policy package for healthier food environments, particularly the component on standards and guidelines for schools. Uh, give a lot of insight into how you actually implement that aspect of the policy. Um, benefits, the engagement of a range of uh, folk and bringing them together to work in this, including the food outlets in close proximity. Uh, the families who are in, in, in those schools will immediately benefit. And it'll, inf it'll add to our on the practice informed uh, policy nationally and regionally at CARFA. The longer term potential impact, of course, is better educational attainment, healthier individuals, more productivity, less cost. Uh, the end. Thank you. <laughs> that, that was uh, definitely on time. Uh, and uh, that didn't mean that uh, it's not an equally important uh, program in the view of WDF as the others. Definitely, uh, our in, uh, funding support to 
prevention and school level progress, uh, programs as this one, a whole of community response has increased in recent years. We have a number of examples in Mexico, in uh, here in the Caribbean, but also in Africa and in, in other parts of the world, even in the Marshall Islands in the Pacific Ocean, where we, have, we are looking uh, uh, on very focused, supporting very focused programs at the school level. And of course, as I said before, all our information is available on our website, or you're welcome to contact me or my colleague, Mr. Madsen, if there's any inquiry about anything on the way we work. And I should also say that what I will also attempt with this panel is to show the different categories of partners that, that, that we work with. Um, we have seen associations, we've seen a regional agency, we've seen a Ministry of Health, and now we will see another category of uh, a, a, a partner uh, that WDF has, and it's in a country where we, we had only had a project more than a decade ago when suddenly we received a proposal from One Stop Shop. I have to say it right. One Stop Shop for Chronic Diseases. But I think I'll not say any more because Dr. Heliante MacDonald will give us the detail of this interesting uh, so program much. in Suriname. Over to you. Thank you. You know when you're not at home, when everybody consistently misspell your name or mispronounce your name but you surely know you're at home when you enjoy the hospitality the friendliness and you share so much uh, which relates to issues challenges you face so i feel at home even when you misspell my name <laughs> but then it's not about me it's about the story i would like to share with what we are doing in suriname and may, as you may notice, I'm not English speaking. I think in Dutch and I speak English. So forgive me uh, when I mispronounce or maybe even use the wrong words, but the intention is great. Um, short presentations, because some of you are looking like you could use lunch. But what I will do is um, shortly introduce our organization in Suriname and with great thanks to uh, the World Diabetic Foundation, which funded our project. Uh, I will uh, talk you through the project, give you some insight on the current project stage, uh, status. But more than that, what our ambitions are as the one-stop shop and the challenges we face. Uh, and then I'll close off with uh, our maybe small CSO, but our ambition to maybe redefine the whole uh, health sector in Suriname, which is required as we are facing the burden of NCDs, which are also uh, challenging our organization. Um, the history of our organization, but I'd like to give a history of the history. Our Diabetics Association was established in 1989, a patient's association. And by 2001, I believe, it was a small survey that demonstrated that only 21% of patients um, seen during that survey of 90 clinics uh, of general practitioners in the coastal area were well regulated. Only 21% of diabetic patients were well regulated. In 2000. Two, we introduced a national uh, DM protocol for general practitioners. And the first project funded by uh, WDF was in 2000, somewhere between 2004 and 2008, which assisted uh, the, with the training of the first diabetic nurses within our country, lying in foundation for diabetic care. Our uh, one-stop shop. Uh, is we have three locations, we operate from three locations, and as is in our names, it is a one-stop shop because we recognize that patients often have to go back and forth to see a lot of uh, specialists and uh, people seeing them, and what we provide in our service is they come to one place and we um, create all services at that same spot and all services include what you have been hearing the, the whole morning about the need for psycho, psychological uh, consults, uh, nutritionists, uh, physiotherapists, the whole circle of, of uh, 
people seeing them. Um, and that is fundamental to our approach. We, everything we, no, sorry, too fast. Um, everything we do within our one-stop shop starts with education. Education to, in, to provide tools to our patients to self-manage their, um, their, 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 their condition, thank you. Uh, so our focus is on primary and secondary education. And we, as much as possible, we integrate prevention, support, and care. And what does education look like? In the coastal area, we take our patients, our clients, we don't call them patients, we take our clients to a 12-week education program, which starts off with basic knowledge about their condition, about what is the process is happening within their system. Uh, and during that 12-week process, we also educate them on, we cook with them. At the spot, we prepare a meal where we show them what are the, the right portions of anything to use in a healthy meal. But not, but not only that, we exercise with them. We exercise them and every client needs to come with at least one companion, one peer, not necessarily a DM patient or client, but somebody in the support circle around them, which knows who after the education 12 week program knows what is going on and how uh, support should be given to that uh, respective client. That is a fundamental to our approach. Um, and, then, and then came the opportunity, um, and I'm here because I did wrote the proposal and I did the early stages of the project development. Because if the, the, the code that resonated with me yesterday, because it's so much uh, what we do, is we realize that in what we offer in the coastal area, we we're not equipped yet to provide that same level of service to those living in the interior of Suriname. But because of the, 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 the quote which resonated with me so much yesterday was, uh, we need to forward in the armor of social justice armed with a sword of information. And because of that social justice came uh, the project to expand our services to uh, the southern part of Suriname being the hinterland, where maybe 10% of the population live, but they face the same challenges. They have uh, the right to the same level of services we provide in the coastal area. So what we did is, um, I'm not gonna read it, you can. Uh, <laughs> I think we have to also, in the interest of time, let's advance uh, the presentation, please, Miss. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm speeding up. <laughs> Um, these are the objectives of our project and I, over lunch, for those who are interested, I can uh, give you some more insight. This is an overview of what we are doing and this is where we, we are now piloting and these are some impressions of the process um, going to places within the interior to make sure that everything we provide in the coastal area, culturally sensitive, makes sense to those persons living in the hinterlands who might not necessarily have the same diet, the same way of um, taking care of their... What are the challenges we face? As we are growing as an organization, uh, we do face some major challenges and that those are more like the same we heard earlier today, so I can speed up there, but maybe uh, pause a little with your permission <laughs> in our ambition for the coming year and coming years and that we um, start out as an, um, an, an NGO and CSO which focuses on DM but we recognize the challenges uh, and would like to be at the center of excellence not only on diabetic care but also uh, on NCDs at large but also um, discuss the, the health system at large but what we do we always do in partnership with all those um, who are on the same uh, page as us in uh, taking that patient-centered approach um, in providing services. I think I did it. 
Yes, but that, that was a very fast end. I think there was one thing that was very interesting, uh, Dr. McDonald, is the way the OSS uh, organization was established. Can you just tell the audience two seconds about how did it emerge? Because Can I think I have that's two minutes. Two minutes, okay, that's fine. <laughs> Not two seconds, two minutes. Yeah, two minutes. Uh, by 2003, we emerged from the pa uh, Patients uh, Association um, and we came out of an, uh, an, uh, an a collaboration, thank you so much, from the Ministry of Health, the two founders who were general practitioners and the patients organization. And we always, our ambition is to always stay close to where health services are provided. So our main locations, we now have three locations, one to the uh, academic hospital in the capital, the second one close to the uh, largest regional hospital in the most western district of Suriname and the third one is uh, where our ad general administration is but also won't and, every, and our education services which is on uh, in a residential area. But there's another thing since I have not used my two minutes yet there's another thing I would like to share in expanding our services to the hinterland er area we are working with a medical mission who has a tradition of more than 100 years providing medical services to the hinterland. So what we are doing in this specific project is connecting to their infrastructure of 50 clinics all across uh, Suriname in the, in the hinterland areas and uh, in partnership with, with them, uh, um, expand the uh, OSS uh, method of providing diabetic care. That and that's quite a challenge because we are a young, flexible organization. They are a rigid, established organization. So in project management terms, we are uh, finding our ways of co collaborating in a most efficient and effective way. Thank you very much, Mr. Let's give him a round of applause to this uh, quite extraordinary program in Suriname. And I, the reason, another reason for us to wishing to show the work of the OSS is that the World Diabetes Foundation has always given priority to supporting agencies who, who go that extra mile to reach communities which are not easily accessible. And I think the hinterland of Suriname is one such area that you don't easily access. Uh, so I think that's a special priority and we would like to share the information about the way WDF uh, gives priority to, 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 to selecting uh, grantees. I'll ask the audience for another final 10 minutes of energy, and then I think soon we'll be at, at lunch. But there is another very important, the final presentation, which is from the Spanish-speaking Caribbean, and it's going to be presented by uh, Mr. Edgar Castillo of uh, the health NGO called Health Horizons International, working in the Dominican Republic. And after the presentation of uh, Mr. Castillo, uh, my colleague, Mr. Madsen, will make a very, very short announcement about our work in the humanitarian setting. Maybe those who were very alert in the beginning saw the slide of Nancy, where there was a list of names, and Jakob, Mr. Madsen's name was there because he's part of that group working on NCD responses in humanitarian settings. So I'll give the word one minute to Jakob, that's all you'll get. And after that, there'll be a very final announcement before lunch, which uh, we will save until till that time. But over to you, uh, Edgar. Well, hello everyone. As, as Mr. Benjamin had, man, uh, uh, had mentioned, my name is Edgar Castillo, I, and I think I am the only uh, Spanish speaking uh, person here. So, oh, sorry, my mistake. Me equivoqué, disculpen. Well, I'm representing Health Horizons International, and it's an NGO that works in the Dominican Republic towards the improvement of community health and but it specializes in the improvement of a primary care system improvement. I would like to thank the WDF and but also the HCC for inviting us to share in this special forum. During this presentation, I will, I will share with you the outcomes and the challenge that we had uh, in the implementation of the first part of the, pro uh, of the project in partnership with the government, the solid civil society, and the WDF, but also a uh, second, uh, second part, I mean a second project that we are currently deploying, on, deploying at the Dominican Republic. As a framework, I will share with you some important facts. 
in the DR, nearly 35% of death causes are due to chronic diseases. Currently, 31% of population has hypertension and 10% has diabetes. It is expected that we are going to have like 1 million people by 2030 uh, uh, affected by diabetes. And related to obesity and overweight, nearly 37% of persons are, has overweight and, older, overweight and 70 and 27% has obesity. Moving on. Moving on, the first project we, that we executed, it was held in partnership with the government, the civil society, and the WDF. Representing the government was the Dominican Ministry of, Ministry of Health that is in charge of the directory of the system and the Servicio Nacional de Salud, Salud SNS, which is in charge to, in, to run in the hospital and the clinic of networks, the DR. Uh, from the civil society, between, uh, along with us, there was uh, participating also the Society for Family Health, an organization that is related with PSI, Population Services International, and finally with the WDF as a key implementing partner. The main objective, the main objective of the project is to improve the, improve the knowledge and capacity of health providers and community health workers in Puerto Plata, a province of the Domin uh, located in the northern region of the Dominican Republic, to provide prevention, timely diagnosis, and quality health care in diverse treatment. This objective we divided into different, into three specific ones. Uh, but before mentioning that, uh, I want to let you know that, as discussed yesterday, we are, in the, we are in line with the general agreement of improving primary care systems to strengthen the NCD fight. The specific objectives were to train health, provi uh, to train health providers and also to com the community health workers uh, to, so they can be able to provide quality health care to diabetic patients and the general population. As the second one, the second specific objective was to the assessment of the risk factors among the population, I mean assessment of age, body mass index, private diagnosis of hypertension and diabetes uh, of them or even on their families, uh, and the level of physical activity, I mean the exercise, if they do exercise or, or, or if they incorporate exercise in their lifestyle. The third one was to promote the empowerment of the population to take care of their health status and incorporate physical activity, but also a healthy lifestyle. The beneficiaries of this project was, as the first part, the doctors and health providers. Among them are the nurses, the lab technicians, the medical interns and doctor assistants. Uh, at the community level, was uh, we incorporated the community health workers and general population. I mean, patients at risk of, of or living with diabetes. Um, also, the, L, the MOH authorities, because we believe and we have learned from past projects that the involvement of directive managers, coordinators from the organization that runs the health in our countries is a key to improve the response in primary care systems. The project execution process that we used to put in place this um, intervention was begins with the selection of the primary care centers. When we use a screening system uh, to assess their functionality, the level of quality, I mean the knowledge that health providers and uh, they have and the capacity to solve uh, different problems. I mean, different issues related with the health service uh, when serving diabetic patients. Um, uh, through this screening system, we screened like uh, 15 primary care centers and we selected 12 among them due to their accessibility level, uh, the presence of the community health workers and doctors, the number of, pop uh, I mean, the population related to that center and the equipment that, that they have 
to be to improve their quality of service. Uh, moving forward, we train the personnel. Okay, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Moving forward, we train the personnel with, you know, with different workshops on diabetes type two treatment and prevention, uh, which, includes, which, which included, oh, sorry. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Quiet. <laughs> <laughs> It used to happen when live presentations. <laughs> well, talking about training the personnel of these primary care centers, we trained them in the handling and, and, and treatment of diabetes type two, but also including information about the bio biological and concept conceptual framework to ease, remember, to ease the remembering of the concepts and their applications. We included also the complications uh, and, and their diabetes handling and prevention. And for the, at the site of the community health workers, we included them to be trained with a special manual, to a special handbook to allow them to provide care, uh, counsel, and, and to access the people, to let them know, to let the population know about how to handle the situation. At the strengthening of primary care systems, uh, we work with them with, the, with monthly sessions to track progress in the, with the health authorities and evaluate achievement of coordinating and coordinating next steps at both the national and local level. And, sorry, I think it has passed along. Just keep going, still it's fine. Okay. In the interest of time, let's move on. Okay. Okay. So at population level, we, we apply it in a screening form to evaluate different parameters, to evaluate different parameters at health population, at population level. But as the presentation is moving on, I will, <laughs> sorry, I will wrap up this with this. We had gathered different special outcomes. Uh, at the supply management, they re, the, these primary care centers receive improvement in their supply chain management area. But also, there was a screening uh, and also an evaluation to determine and to modify the drug therapy that was used at patient level. I mean, with the reducement of the doses, with the reducement, for example, that the doses uh, about the use of metformin. Uh, also, there was a, included in the protocol, the diabetic food and dental evaluation to improve the level of service and diabetic patients. And for the very first time, uh, outside from the college, I mean from the university, the doctors and nurses on these services were trained to provide quality healthcare to, uh, to the population because they only have received Theoretical, theoretical information at the university. So they were trained to provide quality health care to the population. Um, can you come back one, yeah, one One slide back, please. Thanks. I think we especially should look at the top corner to the right, the, the results that you are trying to achieve, Edgar. Because 165 PHCC, what does that mean? Those, it belongs to the primary health care centers. What it, so it's 165? Under this current stage, we are reaching out 165 primary care centers to be trained. So to, that's a lot. Yes. So it's, I can say from the WDF perspective, looking worldwide, comparing all our many, many hundreds of projects, this is a, many clinics. It's a very ambitious program, so it's... Uh, big uh, investment and commitment from the Ministry of Health and from HHI. So I think it's uh, going to be very interesting to follow this work. Yes. So also we have begun to visit- You have a lot of courage. <laughs> we already visited them from the, the, the 
starting the project. And as you mentioned, we are, had a lot of courage with that. But we believe that is spreading out the word and the lessons learned that we have gathered from the first, first project, we are going to improve the, uh, the service and attention of the very, very And that's important what you just said, because there was a project before which was smaller, which gave, us some, gave the ministry and the Health Horizon some lessons that you could build on and moving up to a larger scale program. Yes. Well, as a final, I, I would like to share with you, as Mr. Bennett mentioned, in that uh, the region that we are going to work on has 1.6 million inhabitants. Uh, there are like 25,500 uh, 25, uh, patients that had been screened and identified. But we know there is a sub registry that goes about 40% of patients. So one of the key objectives of this project will be to detect and locate those patients at the level of their primary care centers. Yeah. So finally, thank I want you to very say much. thank you yes. to you all. A round of applause to Edgar Castillo. And then uh, we will simply save the questions for after lunch. But before we move on with the final announcement, I'll give the word to Mr. Mess and just uh, one minute of uh, introduction to the work of WDF under the humanitarian uh, responses to NCDs and why could that be relevant in the Caribbean uh, context? Thank you very much. Uh, I'll try to do this in one minute. Um, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Yes. I'll stand here. Um, <clears throat> as you may know, uh, there are currently uh, more than 65 million people who are who are displaced. Uh, we're living in humanitarian settings. And when I say humanitarian settings, that can be um, um, a situation caused by either man-made uh, disasters such as wars, or it can be natural disasters. And the latter would be more uh, relevant in this region, of course. Um, and this is a huge challenge to diabetes management in, in general. Um, first of all, um, when you live in a humanitarian setting, the, the, the probability of you developing a diabetes is much bigger because of the food environment, uh, the exercise environment, but also because of psychosocial stress, uh, which is caused by these situations. At the same time, uh, the challenges related to diabetes management are really uh, exaggerated several fold uh, compared to other um, low and middle income uh, countries. Um, there, there are huge uh, challenges uh, related to access to uh, prevention uh, and also huge challenges uh, related to access to care, of course. So because of these challenges, uh, the World Diabetes Foundation has recently uh, enhanced this area of, uh, of work um, on top of all the other stuff that we're doing. Um, so we are expecting a lot of uh, increased uh, attention to projects related to humanitarian settings, uh, but also to advocacy initiatives. Um, so with these words, I just wanted to flag that uh, new initiative. Um, and I hope uh, some of you might be interested in, in this area and you're well Welcome to, to contact me. And we've seen from where in our part of the world that the Caribbean has been hit by hurricanes and you have had an earthquake in Haiti. So probably some of this work that we are looking at could also be relevant to your questions. But please approach Mr. Messen. Then I was told by the moderator to open up for questions be before the announcement. I don't know whether anybody would like to make a question or let's keep them from afterwards, right? Yeah, because then we will move on to the final announcement we have, if you allow, moderator. I hope you've been able to see uh, how WDF hopes to support the implementation of meaningful diabetes and NCD responses, prevention and control, following national strategies, following the Global Action Plan goals, following the best buys defined by the WHO, looking at how we can achieve those goals on halting the rise in diabetes and obesity a 25% reduction in mortality and all the other goals that we have to achieve. We uh, support programs also uh, looking at countries that are especially exposed to the burden. And these, among these are small island states. We have for many years supported the Pacific region uh, uh, and the also small island states in the Indian Ocean. And we have, of course, as you've seen, also supported small island uh, development states in, in the Caribbean, but uh, not to the extent we had hoped. So we were delighted when we received an, a proposal from the organization of the Eastern 
Caribbean states, OECS. And that's a few months ago, and it was received by a person who is here, Dr. Kathleen Radix from the health sector of the OECS Secretariat. So what we want to announce today is that that uh, proposal has just been approved by WDF, and and Mr. Radix will, uh, Dr. Radix will uh, just get one minute to tell it what it's about, and then we would like to invite the the countries uh, who are going to be part of the program, and uh, we are looking at. Antigua, Barbuda, Dominica, Grenada, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and Grenadines. But you will tell a little bit about that, Dr. Radix. You won't get one minute because people want to go for lunch, and then we'll have a photograph of uh, uh, the announcement. Speak into, oh, look at that. I thought that was just a calypso. Okay, so, um, your Excellencies, distinguished guest delegates, thanks to Healthy Caribbean Coalition for allowing me some of the precious allotted time to just say some, some thanks. I'm Dr. Carleen Radix, head of the health unit at the OECS. Um, and I just want to say that the OECS makes up seven of the 15 member states of CARICOM. And if we include the associate member states, that's nine of the 20. So we are a significant portion of the success of the CARICOM region um, in fighting against NCDs. And um, Professor Samuels gave a presentation in November of 2017 that had a direct impact on us writing this grant to our Council of Ministers. And coming out of that meeting was a port de France declaration. I encourage you to look up what it says but there was a renewed commitment to sharing and to moving towards um, improved care on NCDs. The project has a few components, similar to projects here, including improving information on diabetes through electronic systems, improving guidelines and um, increasing capacity of health workers, uh, and in the guidelines, focusing not just on medications, but on, on improving diet and improving movement. And of course, CARFA is the agency that we're partnering with in terms of the guidelines. They produced the previous guidelines and we want to move to include prevention. And also to support existing activities and plans of the NCD commissions and ministries of health and the Diabetes Association. So that's all I'm gonna say. Thank I'm gonna ask Radix. my colleagues who, are, who helped me in short notice, put together a grant and um, thank you to WDF for supporting us. So before we take a photograph of that, let's uh, give a round of applause to the panel. This was very, very well executed, if you ask me. And then if we can take a short photograph with you, Dr. Radix. Yes, I have to say, uh, Windrip is also a partner with us on this project. So I, I want to make sure they're not left out. Windrip and Carpenter.